Okay, good evening, good evening, and welcome to our uh, lesson today. As we mentioned on Facebook today, we will be beginning today's lesson with a prayer uh, for Eretz Yisrael, for the land of Israel, for the people of Israel, as we all know that uh, they're going through a very difficult time. Uh, the last 24 hours, I was actually at commission. I was up in Running Springs. I didn't hear any news. I didn't have much internet. But when it came down the mountain and uh, we heard the um, severity of what's going on in Eretz Yisrael, I think it's incumbent upon every one of us to uh, do something in honor of our brothers and sisters in the land of Israel. So we'll start off with the Tehillim. We'll start off the Capital Tehillim, a chapter in Psalms. And then we're going to show a short video. So we'll spend the first 10 minutes of today's uh, lesson uh, on seeing what we can do for Achenu B'nai Yisrael, our brothers and sisters in the land of Israel. And it's going to actually segue into the lesson, into the class about Mashiach. So let's begin with the Kapitel Chaf. If you don't know it, you can just uh, follow after me. I don't have the uh, sheer screen of it. But Kapitel Chaf, we say in times of uh, times that we need Hashem's help. And today in Eretz Yisrael, Baruch Hashem, thank God. Hashem is watching over the land of Israel. He always does. But it's uh, as, as, uh, as brothers and sisters outside of Eretz Yisrael, we have to keep them in mind constantly. And we ask Hashem to bring them sa safety and peace and security. we ask Hashem, you know, we have challenges coming from all sides. On the one hand, we have all the missiles being uh, directed to, uh, towards civilians in Israel. On the other hand, we have people in the press who try to twist everything and try to, at, at worst, blame Israel, but even at best to equ equate both sides and, and, tried, and trying to encourage both sides to de-escalate and completely ignoring the fact that Israel doesn't want Saras, they don't want problems, they want peace. And um, even when we do retaliate or actually defend ourselves, it's called the IDF, Israel defense, the D is for the defense, it's all, where the, it's, all it's there for. 
Um, you know, the, the IDF is strong enough that if they wanted to flatten anything, they could have, but they don't want to. We want to live, live in peace. And even when we, when we defend ourselves, we do everything possible uh, not to hit civilians. But what can we do when the enemy is hiding behind civilians? And it's, it's unacceptable, 400 rockets being uh, showered into, thrown into Israel. I mean, imagine if this would happen here in America, Washington, D.C., hundreds of, of rockets flying into Washington, D.C. Our country would not stand back, would not de-escalate, would not just uh, sit back and watch it. We have to defend our people. It's incumbent upon the Jewish people in the land of Israel, as tiny as it is, to defend itself. And uh, all we want is peace. And we ask Hashem, Amen. I want to show you a short, a, I think it's a nine-minute clip, uh, since we just uh, celebrated Yom Yerushalayim. And uh, my father every year tells us the, uh, the experience that he had. He was in Israel during the uh, Six-Day War. And after they, right after they liberated Jerusalem, and again, this was done as a defense, when after Jordan attacked Israel, and Israel defended itself, and thus recaptured East Jerusalem, and the first time they were able to go down to the Kotel was Shavuot, that was just uh, next week, and uh, the emotions at the Kotel was, was tremendous. But in this video, we'll also watch from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, how even when everybody was, was predicting gloom and doom, the Rebbe was always positive and always quoted the verse in the Torah that God's eyes is upon the land of Israel from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And every Jew can and has a responsibility to help those in Israel through our actions, through our mitzvahs, through our prayers, and every other way that we can help. So I'm going to show you the short video, and then we'll segue into the class. I was 12 in the spring of 1967. I remember a sense of fear that led to a bonding of all the Jews in Israel. For three weeks, we were all kind and loving to one another. My father was a Holocaust survivor who had seen whole Jewish communities decimated by an invading aggressor. I was joyously participating in civil defense chores, digging bomb shelters, taping windows, painting over car headlights. He was preparing himself for the decimation of his people. moves 100,000 troops, 1,000 tanks, and 900 heavy guns into the Sinai Desert. The Egyptian military signs a pact with Syria to the north and Jordan to the east, tightening a noose around Israel's neck. Holocaust scenarios are being discussed openly in the media. After 19 years of an uneasy ceasefire, Israel's enemies are finally going to take up where they left off in 1949. Headlines predict a bloody end. Israeli Defense Department estimates expect at least 10,000 dead in the impending war. Chief Rabbi Gorn sent men to inspect public parks to decide which would be converted to cemeteries after the war. May 23rd, Egypt closed the Straits of Tehran to Israeli shipping cutting off Israeli ports in Elat from the rest of the world. The move is officially an act of war. Finally, on May 28th, Prime Minister Eshkol addresses the nation attempting to calm the raw nerves. He stumbles, obviously not believing his own words. The address only increases the panic. 
On that same day, in Brooklyn, New York, 20,000 school children gathered at a parade for the Lagba Omer holiday. Foreign embassies ordered their citizens out of Israel. Many people turned to the Rebbe, inquiring whether they should leave. The Rebbe responded. To the students of Yeshivas Torahs Emes, Jerusalem, greetings and blessings. In response to your telegram, you should continue to study Torah diligently, together with all the students. Certainly the guardian of Israel shall not slumber nor sleep. May we hear good tidings. Menachem Schneerson. The Rebbe's responses were published widely in the Israeli press. In influencing these people to remain, the Rebbe took personal responsibility for their safety. He also, in effect, guaranteed to parents that their children would return home safely. On June 3rd, the Rebbe called on Jewish men everywhere, particularly soldiers of the IDF, to put on tefillin, if only once, to fulfill the Torah commandment for Jewish males to don phylacteries. He quoted the words of the Midrash. In a special telegram to the Israeli Defense Forces, the Rebbe added, Soldiers who cannot don tefillin in the morning should do so later in the day. Surely the guardian of Israel shall not slumber nor sleep. The Lord is at your right hand. God will strengthen you and you will return home safely. Israeli newspapers were soon running stories of the Rebbe's promise that the enemies of Israel will fear and abandon their schemes against her in merit of Jews putting on tefillin. Jewish men in Israel and around the world began to line up to support their brethren in Israel through the Rebbe's new tefillin campaign. At 7.45 a.m. on June 5, 1967, 183 planes took off from Israeli airfields to attack air bases across Egypt. Within eight hours, almost the entire Egyptian Air Force would be destroyed. In the battle on the ground, the IDF destroyed more than 800 Egyptian tanks and thousands of soldiers were taken prisoner. 80% of Egypt's military equipment was lost in the Sinai Desert in under 48 hours. At 9.45 a.m., Jordanian forces in southeast Jerusalem opened artillery fire along the border and Jordanian troops entered the UN's Jerusalem complex. Israel mounted a strong response by the morning of June 6, the IDF Central Command occupied areas around Jenin, the Dotan Valley, and the eastern slopes of Mount Gilboa. In 25 hours of bloody battle, East Jerusalem and Shem were taken. The site of the Holy Temple, including its western wall, was liberated. Avirarim, salul
Okay, so I, I, I think what the, sorry. one of the beautiful ideas in this video was that the Rebbe kept on mentioning that it is through our mitzvahs, our tefillin, our Shabbos candles, our love of our fellow, our respect, our unity, these do have an effect, an effect on the world around us and can help the situation even across the globe in the land of Israel. And today we're gonna to focus on how that is possible, how that happens, how it works. What is the mitzvah? And we're gonna connect it to the Messianic era because that's the, uh, the, less the uh, course, but uh, it's a very fascinating idea, the effect that a mitzvah has and how it connects to Mashiach and what we can do, how, what we can do today to help our brethren in the land of Israel. So with that, we'll begin the lesson. If you have your books, it's on page number uh, 90. No, sorry, it's on page number 97. Okay. So let me just get it here. I don't know. That seems like, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. There's some setting here that's so off here. Let me just get the PowerPoint up and running. Okay, there we go. Okay, good. So page number 90 today, 97. Today we're going to start off with the idea of mitzvahs, and we're going to discuss the idea of reward and result. You see, it, it's sort of a trilogy. We started last week. Remember last week we spoke about the Dira B'tachtenim, how God specifically wanted a dwelling place in this lowly world. We mentioned the idea that worlds, by definition, are a concealment, that the word olam and helam are, are related. So it's the idea of a concealment, and those, the, the stronger the concealment, the lower the world. And today we're going to go into the idea of mitzvahs and see how they connect to the Messianic era. And what does it mean when Maimonides says that we have to anticipate the Mashiach every day, constantly? It's not just to believe in the Mashiach, but it's also to anticipate the Mashiach, so with that, let's begin the exercise 3.1. You don't have to answer this question out loud, but you'll just uh, think about it yourself and we'll get back to it. So choose a mitzvah that you do regularly. Let's say attend Shabbos service, keep kosher, give charity, put on tefillin, study Torah. And ask yourself the question, why do you do this mitzvah? You can select one or more of the following. Why do we do this mitzvah? Is it because God said so? It makes my life more orderly and stable. It makes my life more spiritual. It strengthens my Jewish identity. It feels right. It makes the world a better place. I believe that God's will, God will reward me for doing mitzvahs. I'm afraid to disobey God or other. 
I just put a check in it because later on we'll get back to this and we'll see what the proper Jewish approach to performing mitzvahs are. Okay, so for, but first let's sort of digress a bit and we're going to uh, talk about reward for doing mitzvahs. So the idea of reward and punishment for doing mitzvahs means consequence consequences for, for our actions is actually one of the foundations of Judaism. Remember last week we learned about the 13 principles of Judaism based on Maimonides. So number, I think it's 10 or 11, I think it's 11, is that there are rewards and punishments to our actions. There are consequences to our actions. Let's see if I can make you yeah, unmute yourself. Oh, here we go. Now you can unmute yourself if you want to. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at text number one. This text we actually read in the Torah last week in synagogue, Taparshas Bechokaisai, where it says, if you follow my statutes and keep my commandments and observe them, I will provide you rains in the proper time. The earth will give its produce and the trees of the field will yield their fruits. What do we see here? Isn't this a classical example of reward? Right? If you will listen to my commandments, then you will get ABC. That's like a parent telling a child, if you listen to me, I'll, I'll give you a candy, I'll give you an ice cream, right? That's basically what the reward, that's, that's the reward. But the question really is, is the reward in Judaism, is it a prize? Is it sort of a payment for our good behavior? So for example, since I put on tefillin, since I was a good, I was a mensch, therefore I get rewarded with health and prosperity and nachas and in this world and in the next world I get, uh, you know, whatever is up there. So that's the reward. I did something and Hashem rewards me with a, a prize. But in Judaism, we'll see that's not really what reward and punishment is. That's not what the consequence is. So let's take a look at text number two and explain. This is from the Alter Rebbe in Tanya. This ultimate perfection, the age of Mashiach and the resurrection, namely the revelation of the infinite radiance of God in this physical world, depends on our actions and our work throughout the duration of exile. For the reward of a mitzvah is the result of the mitzvah itself. That's the key line. This is because with the performance of the mitzvah, one elicits God's infinite radiance so that it descends into and is integrated within the physical man matter of this world. So what's what Alter Rebbe is saying? He's saying a couple of ideas. Number one, which we'll get to soon, is that the Mashiach is the ultimate state of perfection. That's the first line. Uh, number two, whilst in the era of Mashiach, a lot of things will happen, like the sick will be healed and there won't be poverty and death, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but there's also a spiritual revolution that will happen. And because of the spiritual revolution, that's why all the physical and material delights will, will occur too. We learned that last week. We'll focus a little bit more on this under this week. Uh, number three, how do we achieve it? Through our mitzvahs. Our mitzvahs actually will achieve this messianic era. And number four, which is key, the reward of a mitzvah is the result of a mitzvah itself. Okay? That means some people think, I do a mitzvah, and what's the reward? I don't know, I'll win the lottery, or I'll have peace in my home, or I'll, I'll have health whatever it may be. I do one thing, I put on tefillin, God will give me something else. But the Alter Rebbe says, no, that's not the Jewish approach to, to, to reward and punishment. The reward of the mitzvah is the result of the mitzvah itself. In the Pirkei Avot, it says, Har mitzvah mitzvah. The reward of the mitzvah is the mitzvah itself. So let's, like, let's sort of delve into this and see what does it mean the reward of the mitzvah is the result of the mitzvah. What it's telling us is that Mashiach, the Messianic era, is not just a reward for the mitzvahs. God says, you do mitzvahs, I'll bring Mashiach. No, it's the result of our mitzvahs. So, so let me give you a, a scenario here. Um, so let's say an example. You work 20 years for a sneaker factory. Okay? It's 20 years, you're making sneakers, you're making shoes. 
and you save up enough money after 20 years to buy a home. Now, is that home, is that house, is it a reward or is it a result? It's a reward. You could do anything you want with the money. You saved up 20 years money. You took that money and now you're rewarding yourself. You're buying yourself a house. The house and the shoes, your sneakers have nothing in common. <laughs> there's nothing, there's no connection. When, a, when your boss pays you money after a week's work, the actual money has nothing to do with your work, whatever you did. It's just a reward. You did work, I'm gonna reward you with a paycheck. But scenario B is a guy who takes bricks and lumber and other materials and builds himself a house. Now that, hut, that house at home is a result of his hard work. It's not a reward, it's a result. He put bricks together and he put uh, you know, lumber together. And the result of that was that he had a house. He, 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 uh, so the act of doing the mitzvah, it's not just something that God rewards us by sending Mashiach or any other reward. But the act of doing a mitzvah creates, as we learned last week, a home for Hashem. And that is the messianic reality. Every mitzvah we do shapes the world into a messianic reality until the whole world is a Mashiach world. Let's, let, let, let's, let's step back a bit and try to understand it more in, in basic terms. We discussed last week that Hashem, that God is present everywhere, right? God's present. We say, make a home for God in this world. It's a very, very famous Kabbalistic idea to make a home for God in this world. God is everywhere, right? It's, 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 can't make a home for him. Making a home for him means that he wasn't here before. God is everywhere, but he's concealed, right? How do we make for God a home? How do we make him a home in this world? What, what, what makes your home your home? Well, you bought it, right? But, you know, sometimes people come back from vacation. I'm sure we can all relate to that. You went on vacation for a week or two and you come home and you say, ah, home, sweet home. I'm home. But the vacation you went on, whether it was a cruise or a hotel, was much nicer than your home, much more expensive than your home, right? So why do we say home sweet home? Why do we feel so comfortable in our home? Because in a home is a place that we are fully ourselves. We can be ourselves in our home. You know, you can drink Coke out of the bottle. Yeah, everything is good, right? You're in home. No, nobody judges you. You're home. Making a home for God means a place where godliness is fully revealed and expressed. It's not concealed. Just like you reveal yourself, people walk in their home, you know, with clothing or, or lack of clothing that they wouldn't out, outdoors. Because in a, at home, we express ourselves. However, we go out, you know, we're now we're watching what are people thinking? What are they saying? We conceal part of ourselves when we are outdoors, when we're not at home. Making a home for Hashem, for God in this world, means making a place where God is revealed. God is here anyways. So let, let, me, let me share you with you this, uh, this cute clip here. There we go. So you have a piano. Anyone see this piano? Right. Everyone sees it here? What is this here? This is a, everyone agrees to the piano? Yeah, it looks like a piano, right. So let's say you put this piano and you have three, thank you. You have three different worlds. You have three different real, different worlds, say. In the first world, you're talking about a world of people like we live in today. In the second world, there are no humans. Sorry, there's no music. There's humans, but there's no music. In the third world, all there is in this world is woodpeckers. So here you have the three worlds. The first world is the world we live in today with music. Second world, nobody knows any music. Nobody ever heard of any music. The third world has no humans but woodpeckers. Okay, let's get back to seeing everyone here. Good. So I'd like to see your reaction here. So these are the three worlds. Now you took that piano and put it in the first world, right? What do you get? What do people look, you look at that, Piano, what do people say? Wow, that's a piano, right? 
beautiful piano. And if you're a musician, you may even walk by and play the piano. You say, wow, a, whole, a, a crowd will gather and listen to your piano, to music. Now you put it in the second world, in the second universe, where there's no music, and you ask people what they see, what will they say? Remember, this, this universe has no music. What will they say they see? Piece of furniture, a table, right? They don't know music, right? So they have little funny white buttons on it, but they basically see a piece of furniture. They may put their food on it. They may put their pictures on it, which we do anyways. And that's, that's, that's the second universe. How about the third universe that only has woodpeckers? What will happen there? What will they see when they see this piano? They'll see a piece of wood and they'll start pecking away, right? Hopefully there's some food behind here, All right? It's a piece of wood. Now, this object is the same. This piano is the same in all three worlds. It's equally present in all three worlds. What's the difference? The difference is only in the awareness and perception, okay? The first, in the first universe, in our universe, people are more perceptive of music, they're more aware of it, and therefore they see a piano. The second world, not so aware, they see a piece of furniture, but they're not so aware of music. The third, they're totally unaware. All they see is, all, all the woodpecker see is, is, is wood. But this difference is very significant because the limited awareness of the piano in, in, in universe two really blocks the object's true nature. This is a piano, it's not a piece of furniture, it's a piano. And it really reduces the essence of this piano, its purpose. And in universe three with the woodpeckers, it's an even greater concealment. Now it's reduced to just a piece of wood, not even a furniture, just a piece of wood. So our world is like a piano. This is what Hasidus explains. We can experience it like a flock of woodpeckers, you know, blind to everything other than just trying to get something out of it, right? We're just looking at the physical material world, trying to peck, peck, peck. Perhaps we can get some morsel out of it, some, some benefit out of the world, get some fun out of it. That, that's, that, that's, a very, that's a very concealed level. But perhaps there's something deeper than that, right? We have intellectual sensitivities. <laughs> And therefore we can perhaps sense there is, there is a mission, there's something within this world that's more than just a piece of wood, more than just a, 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 a happenstance reality. And finally, we can learn to play the piano. We can learn to experience the world for what it truly is. What's the world? It's an instrument through which Hashem, which God chose to express his goodness and perfection. And how do we accomplish this? It's through mitzvahs. The mitzvahs are the tools which we penetrate all the layers of concealment and reveal, we, we actualize the true nature and function of our existence. So some people go through life all their life and just look at the world like a, like a woodpecker looks at a, at a they don't see any, any, anything deeper than the material world. Others recognize there is something deeper but they don't know exactly what. They're searching, searching, searching. And then there's the deeper reality. The Torah teaches us exactly why Hashem created the world, created the world to reveal the true nature and purpose of the world, the nature, the purpose of the piano, to make music, to play it. How do we play it? What are the notes? Those are the mitzvahs. Let's take a look at text three, how it, the author of explains this idea. Through the performance of a mitzvah, a person causes a flood of God's infinite light to descend from above and be enclosed within the corporate reality of the world, within an object that was previously under the dominion of and whose existence depended on the spiritual forces that obscure the God reality. This includes all things that are kosher and permissible with which a mitzvah is then performed. For example, the parchment of Yuzin Tvilin, a mezuzah or a Torah scroll, an etrog, so long as it is not urla, money given to charity, so long as it has not been dishonestly acquired, and similarly with other material things. When one uses these objects to perform God's mitzvah, 
and thereby fulfill his expressed desire, their vivifying force ascends and is absorbed within God's infinite light. So this is what, this is the, going back to the analogy of the piano. I know it's a piano. I have a piano right here to my right. I can't play piano. My wife plays piano. I don't play piano. So even though I know it's a piano, I can press the, uh, the keys on the piano and you'll probably go like this. You don't want to hear what you don't want to hear it. It doesn't sound good. Why? Because I'm not playing music. I'm not playing prop, a, a song. It's, it's, it's a, there's no harmony there. However, somebody who knows how to play the keys properly can bring out some beautiful, beautiful music within this instrument, within this object called the piano. And so too, Hashem put us in this world and says, there's a beautiful instrument here. Go ahead and play. Now, if he left it up to us to figure it out, we can grope around and plan and, you know, press the buttons, but it may not sound nice. So Hashem specifically gave us the musical book, the Torah, the mitzvahs. Every mitzvah that we perform is a key, is a right key, a proper key that brings this beautiful um, melody. So when all of us do mitzvahs, all our mitzvahs together, they create this phenomenal melody and reveal the true essence, the purpose of creation. And that's what it means to make a dwelling place for Hashem in this world, to truly reveal what he wanted, what his purpose was in this world, to take the materialistic objects in the world and utilize it for, for its ultimate purpose. Now we're going to learn how with it, we're going to take us all full circle, circle soon. We're going to learn now within the mitzvahs itself, there are two categories, two ways we can do that. Let's take a look at text four. This is from the Rebbe. There are two aspects to every mitzvah, page 104. One aspect is the fact that with every mitzvah that we do, we fulfill God's will. In this regard, there's no difference between one, one mitzvah and the next. An individual fulfills a mitzvah not because of its unique qualities and its unique effects, but simply to carry out God's will. This aspect of the mitzvah is aptly demonstrated in the observance of Rabbi Shem, Rabbi Shem of Yadi, that if you were commanded to chop wood, we would do it in obedience to the divine will with the same enthusiasm as we fulfill the mitzvah of to fill it. So number one, God told us to do it, we do it simply because he told us to do it. The second aspect of the mitzvah is that each mitzvah brings a spiritual refinement to the individual performing the mitzvah. Similarly, the mitzvah brings a spiritual refinement to the object with which it is performed and ultimately refines the world. What's the difference? The difference between these two elements is that with the first aspect, the specifics of the mitzvah are irrelevant. All mitzvahs are equal for they are equally God's will. By contrast, the second element highlights the significance of each mitzvah specific details where each mitzvah brings us dissimilar branch of spiritual enhancement to the soul and refines the world in a different way. So what is the author, what's the Rebbe saying here? That there's two aspects to every mitzvah. And, and in these two aspects is the way that the mitzvah transforms reality, creating a dwelling place for Hashem. So let's discuss these two aspects. Number one, is to reveal godliness in this world. We live in a world that godliness is concealed. And Hashem says, when we do a mitzvah, we reveal the purpose of this physical world, right? So to reveal the concealment of the world, we do that by performing a mitzvah. Which mitzvah? Doesn't matter. God tells us to do something, we do it. That's the mitzvah, we fulfill his will, and his will is revealed in this world. But it doesn't matter what the mitzvah is. Let me example example. If your wife or your husband asks you to do something and you do it, why do you do it? You do it, hopefully, yeah, because they want you to do it, because you're in a relationship and your wife wants you to do something. So you do it. In that, in that aspect, it doesn't matter what they want you to do, whether they want you to take out the garbage or help wash the dishes or clean up the house or cook, or, 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 or it doesn't matter what it is. The main thing is you are fulfilling the wishes of your spouse. That's all, that's all that matters, right? It's not about me, it's about us. So going back to the mitzvahs, in this respect, every mitzvah is the same. Hashem wants us to do something, we do it. Baruch Hashem, we, fulfill, we, we, we revealed godliness in this world, okay? That's number one. 
But then there's another element of the mitzvahs in making a dear of Tachtenim a dwelling place for Hashem. And that's by refining and elevating every particular piece of the world. And we do that by performing mitzvahs with the different parts of our bodies, with our different parts of the world. How many mitzvahs did Hashem give us? 613. It's a lot of mitzvahs. It's a heck of a lot of mitzvahs. First he told us 10. You have 10. And then we said, okay, I got another one. I got another one. And all of a sudden we have 613 mitzvahs. Why so many mitzvahs? If, I, if, all, if all God wanted was for us to listen to him, to have a relationship with him, give us 10, give us five, give us two, give us one. And that's good enough. We, we created this relationship. But the second element of the mitzvah is we're refining a specific element of the world and a specific element of ourself. Okay, so whether it's a physical object, whether it's a character trait within ourselves, whether it's a talent, uh, a natural resource, uh, a cultural phenomenon, when you're when you're performing a mitzvah, you're refining that part of yourself or the world. It could be your emotions. So, for example, when you daven, you pray, you're moving your lips, and you're hopefully dedicating your heart. If your mother asks you, or your wife asks you to, uh, to 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 go out shopping, you have patience you're patient you're refining your patience right or uh the, the, your your physical effort you're schlepping uh the bags from the, into the car into the house so these are all involved in the action of honoring your parents okay so you're, you're now refining not just you're not just creating a relationship with god but you're refining the entire world that he created so in re, in regard to the second s element every mitzvah is different because each mitzvah engages a different part of our personality and a different part of our lives and a different part of the world. So, for example, we observe Shabbos. It instills in us the awareness that there's a creator in the world. When we pr uh, perform family purity, mikvah, it enhances and elevates our, 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 our intimacy, intimate life, marriage, right? And ensuring that we treat our spouse like an individual, like a person, not an object. Charity cultivates our compassion to others, our sense of uh, communal responsibility. So every mitzvah now is very important in the individual mitzvah. Text number five from the Midrash. Does God truly mind if a person slaughters an animal from the throat or slaughters him from the back of the neck? Rather, the mitzvahs were given only to refine individuals who perform them. So Hashem gave us a mitzvah of shechita. We have, we have to eat, if you want to eat an animal, it has to be slaughtered a certain way. God cares how it's slaughtered this way, that way. But yes, because Hashem wants us to slaughter an animal in the most humane way. If you did it from the back, it would be more painful. And therefore it has to be done from the neck. So the laws of shechita actually instill within ourselves the sensitivity towards animals. We have other mitzvahs too that are associated with that. For example, if you have an animal, you have to feed your animal first. That's a law. It's halacha. To, again, these are things that are supposed to uh, bring sensitivity to a specific element in our lives. So the first element of the mitzvah is just connect to God. Fulfill God's desire. But the second function of the mitzvah is to refine the person and every individual aspect of the person. When we refine that element then we reveal God within that element. So for example, uh, is, is this paper, I have a paper here, is this holy? Is God, is, God, is God found in this paper? Yeah, God's found everywhere, right? But is it a holy paper? I could throw it in the garbage. What is the purpose of this paper? The purpose of the paper is that I should do something good with it, something holy with it, do a mitzvah with it. And when I do a mitzvah with it, then this becomes holy because the purpose of it was revealed. That's what holiness is. What is holiness? Holiness is spirituality revealed. So for example, if I have a siddur, it's the same paper, but a siddur I can't throw in the garbage. This paper I could, both paper. And the answer is because the siddur I used for a holy purpose. I, I, I brought out the purpose why it was created. And therefore, it became holy. When I put the oil in my menorah, for example, put my oil in the menorah, I can take the rest of the oil and throw it in the garbage because the oil is not holy. Once I used the oil and made a blessing on it, 
many people have a custom that that extra oil they don't throw out. They use it for something else or they try to light the next night because now I reveal the purpose of that oil, which was to serve God. And since it's revealed, that's the definition of holy. So that's the idea of refining everything in the world. Uh, text six actually brings out, uh, it says, a person, Hashem, Hashem created so many mitzvahs that wherever you turn, you should be able to do a mitzvah. So for example, you sow a field. Well, you don't uh, do hybrid, hybrid planting. You reap, you have to leave some for the poor. Uh, you, what, is, what else does it say here? Uh, you need dough, you have to give the first dough the challah. You remove eggs from a nest, send away the mother bird, slaughter wild animal, cover its blood with soil, plant a tree. You know, don't eat the first three years of its fruit. In everything you, everything you do, even your most mundane things, Hashem has instilled uh, mitzvahs in order that we should be able to reveal the purpose of creation. So we do it, in, just to recap, we do it in two ways. Number one, in a general way, that every mitzvah action that we do connects us to Hashem in a general way, but a more specific way, every mitzvah actually refines that particular part of the world. And actually, we'll soon see, brings out the Messianic spark, the Mashiach spark within the world. Now, as we know, Mashiach is supposed to affect the entire world. Now, how many things in the world are affected by mitzvahs? Is it possible for us to affect the entire world by mitzvahs? There's only a small fraction of the world's resources that are used for mitzvahs. So, for example, how much of the, uh, of the, of the world GNP is used for charity? How much? Not a lot, right? Percentage-wise. Uh, what percentage of animal hides are used for parchment to make a mezuzah or to fill in? Very little. Very little, right? And even in our own lives, percentage-wise, how much of our brain power is utilized to, to study Torah or, or to daven? Not much, right? Percentage-wise. Out of 24 hours in our day, how many mitzvahs, how many, um, how many hours or how many minutes do we actually use to do mitzvahs? Not many. Not many. So if that's the case, we don't really have an opportunity to refine the whole world because only a very, very small part of the world are going to be used for mitzvahs. But today we're going to learn that's not the case. We do have the ability to transform the entire world. I want to introduce it with a video because I think this video brings out this point so beautifully and it will, get, will allow us to really get an appreciation of how we're able to transform the entire world when seemingly we only use a small part of it for mitzvahs. Okay. Muster an army of workers, machines, factories, ships, trains, and endless natural supplies. What do you get? A pencil. In 1958, Leonard Reed penned a classic to document the mind-boggling diversity of materials and skilled labors required for a single manufactured object. He detailed the production of a pencil, speaking in the pencil's voice. My family tree begins with a cedar of straight grain. Contemplate all the saws and trucks and rope and the countless other gear used in harvesting and carting the cedar logs to the railroad siding. Think of all the persons and the numberless skills that went into the fabrication of these logging tools. The mining of ore, the making of steel and its refinement into saws, axes, motors, the growing of hemp and bringing it through all the stages of heavy and strong rope. Reed describes railroad networks and communication systems that bring the logs to mills and the mill work that produces thin slats. He asks, how many skills went into supplying the heat, the light and power, the belts, motors, and all the other things a mill requires? 
Reed includes the workers who constructed the hydro plant that supplies the mill's power, trains that transport the slats, a factory that cost millions to erect and equip with brilliant machines that slit the slats and insert the lead, and the lead itself, produced by mixing graphite mined in Sri Lanka with clay from Mississippi and treating it with Mexican wax. The pencils receive six coats of lacquer and are labeled with carbon black mixed with resins. An eraser holder made of zinc and copper is attached, and black nickel rings are added. Finally, the pencil's eraser is a rubber-like product made with Indonesian rapeseed oil, Italian pumice, sulfur chloride, vulcanizing and accelerating agents, and cadmium sulfide. One pencil, millions of dollars, dozens of countries, thousands of miles. But we can add something radical that Reed never considered. What if this pencil belongs to David, who uses it for Torah classes? It helps him observe the mitzvah of Torah study. That changes everything. Divinity generated by his mitzvah illuminates his soul and body and elevates the pencil as well. That powerful godly light travels back along the pencil's production route, elevating the factory, railroads, minerals, investments, skills, lives, and all that Reed so vividly described. Think about that the next time you offer charity. Light a Shabbat candle or wind tefillin around your arm. With each mitzvah act, so much of this world is connected with divinity. Okay. I think that's beautiful. It, it just goes to show how, you know, using one material object uh, can go such a far way in refining the world. Um, the, I read recently, uh, there was a guy by the name of Andy George, I think he was from Minnesota. And in 2015, he decided to make a sandwich, I think it was a turkey sandwich from scratch. And when I say from scratch, I mean from scratch. He, he literally, he raised the vegetables, he planted them, uh, he planted and raised the wheat, uh, to make the bread, he then I think we har harvested milk too, which whatever he wasn't Jewish. Uh, the eggs, the honey, the oil, the chicken. He raised the chicken, and he put it all together to make a chicken sandwich. <laughs> he even took a plane flight to the ocean to collect seawater that he used to make salt. Okay, right? and he took he made a press to extract oil from sunflower seeds to make mayonnaise. I mean, he literally made a sandwich from, from, from scratch. You can look at it, you can see him on, on YouTube. He documented the whole thing. And I think in YouTube it's entitled, how to make a $1,500 sandwich in only six months. That's what it took him. It took him $1,500 in six months to make a sandwich from scratch. Now, when we eat our sandwich, we make a blessing and we think, what did we do? We refined a piece of bread. We refined a, whatever, a turkey, a piece of turkey. But in truth, everything that went into making that bread and that turkey and that and that vegetable and anything that made come or, or the Torah or the or the uh, the, the Siddur, we refine everything that went in, all the energy and all the effort and all the money that went into that, we can refine it by doing a mitzvah with it with a physical object. Just also <laughs> show how 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 far fetched how, how far uh, um, we can go and affect the world even by one mitzvah. So every mitzvah we do, every object that we use to do it, especially in today's world, we live in a very interconnected world, like, 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 like never before. I mean, if you look at the textbook that you're, you're reading from now, you're learning Torah from, uh, maybe it was printed in China and it was transported on a ship that was built, built in Holland. And the software that it was designed, uh, maybe it came from California. The person who laid it out actually comes from Australia. And we're here learning about Mashiach with this book, right? So we're actually uniting and refining, we're elevating everything that went into making this, this book. So in this way, every mitzvah, every action that we do brings the entire world one step closer to making a home for Hashem, Adira B'Tavtonim, and the Messianic state of absolute goodness and perfection in the world. Okay, so actually, if you go back to the, the beginning of the class, and we asked the question, 
And the question was on page 97, choose a mitzvah. Um, why do you do this mitzvah? Select one of the following. If you said all the above, there would be right too. But ultimately, ultimately, the, re the, the, the effect of the mitzvah is... It makes the world a better place. It makes my life more spiritual. It makes my life more, more, more stable. But ultimately is to make the world a more Mashiach awareness place, to elevate, to refine the, the world. Okay. Let's go on. Okay. We'll take this a step further. This is, I think, a fascinating idea. Uh, last week in lesson two, we spoke about the idea that when we do a mitzvah, we become partners in the creation, right? And if you look at text seven, actually, it's another verse here. The Torah considers those who recite the passage of Ayahulu during the eve of Shabbat prayer as if they became partners with God in the work of creation. So we, we, God wants us to become partners in the creation. And this is a key word, partners. And if we, if we really get the, uh, to understand what does it mean to be partners with God in creation, we'll also better understand the idea of Mashiach. What does it mean to be a partner? So imagine you walk into a, a business, you walk into a, um, a store, and you see a guy behind the counter, right? Two people behind the counter. One is an employee, and one is the owner, the partner. Now, can you tell the difference? Who is the owner and who is the employee? They're both standing behind the counter, taking money, helping out their customers. No, they're doing the same thing, right? They're both standing behind the counter, both serving their customers. But if you look closer, you'll notice there are subtle or maybe even not so subtle differences. How about they go their work, their, how, how they go about their job? What's the differences between an employee and a partner? Anyone want to give an idea? What's the difference between a, an employee and a partner? <clears throat> a partner is more invested. A partner is more invested. Good. Yeah. Any other ideas? He looks important. He dresses the part. He acts the part. Okay. <laughs> okay, good, good. So, so let's give an analogy. Let's take, for example, uh, Apple. Okay, Apple uh, computers, they are, you know, they have a huge, huge place up in Northern California, tens of thousands of employees, right? You have salespeople, you have... Uh, assembly line workers, you have managers, PR people, HR people, you have uh, secretaries, security guards, so many people employed by Apple, right? And they each have to know their job, right? Security knows he has to keep the, the building secure. The, the software has to know how to make software. Everyone has to know their job. But do they have to know the mission statement or what the uh, purpose of the company is? Does the, does the security guard have to know what Apple is making in this building? No, not necessarily. It would be nice, some companies like when, when all their employees are on, on board and know exactly they're part of the team, so to speak, but it's not, it's not so, so important. That's not vital that everyone in the company should know exactly what, what the mission statement or what, 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 what the purpose of the company is, right? The, the, that's the employees, but the, the owner, the owner has to constantly be on target. His eye has to be on the mission statement. He has to know what it's all about, right? And the same is true with the mitzvahs that we do. As the Rebbe writes here in uh, uh, te text eight, Rabbi Yol Khan, who is, uh, writes, uh, well, the, he's actually one of the uh, transcribers of the Rebbe Sichas, he says, a Jew can argue, practically, why is it important for me to know that the redemption will arrive someday? I need to do my work and fulfill that which God instructs me to do. It's not my business to know or to be concerned with the greater objectives and results of my service. The fallacy of this approach should be self-understood. But here's an illustration. Imagine a soldier in the midst of a battle, standing up and saying, it's not my business to know why my commanding officer gave me an order to fire my weapon. All that's important is that I meticulously follow the orders handed down by the chain of command. 
the fact that my actions impact the outcome of the battle, causing the enemy to retreat and bringing my side closer to victory is irrelevant to me. I just need to shoot my rifle. This soldier, even if he uh, executes every order he's given, will lack morale and passion. Moreover, without a doubt, to one degree or another, it will negatively impact his performance on the battlefield. The same is true regarding our service of God through Torah mitzvah observance. We, can't, we cannot claim that it's not our concern whether or not our service affects the long-awaited victory. We must know that there is a campaign underway and that it is our, our mission to bring it to a successful conclusion. We must be keenly aware of the reality that with each additional mitzvah, we reveal more godliness in this world, thereby moving a step closer to the ultimate triumph. So a person may say, yeah, who cares, Mashiach, it's going to come, it's not going to come. I'm just worried about li listening to God, following God's command. They tell a story of this, uh, they wanted to test some you know, potential soldiers to go into the army. They wanted to see how loyal they would be, how, how they would listen to their commander. So they decided to do a, a, a test. And they had an individual sit in a room and there was a gun on the table. And it was only a test. So they got the first person, they said, go inside, take the gun and shoot the person. So the first guy goes inside, he comes out after a minute, he says, I can't, I can't, I can't shoot a person. Okay, you can't go in the army. So the second person, go in and shoot, shoot him. Second guy goes in, waits a minute, a minute and a half, he comes out, he says, I can't, I just can't shoot the guy. The third guy, he goes in, they tell him, shoot the person. He goes in, after two minutes, they start hearing banging and crashing and that thing, and, loud noises and finally the guy comes out all disheveled i guess what happened he says well i took the gun i tried to shoot there was nothing in the gun so i had to kill him with the chair if all we know is if all the soldier knows whatever the officer says i don't care we're going to win the battle not to win the battle it doesn't matter i'm just going to listen to my officer number one he'll lose the morale he's not going to be on the team member he's not going to have passion and he's not gonna be involved as much. So it's important to know, not just what the reward is gonna be, it's not about the reward. It's important to know what is the purpose of this war? What's the purpose of this whole mission, of this whole, of, of, the, of, of, the, um, of the company? If you really some, want somebody to be passionately involved in the company, they have to know what it's all about. They have to know what's the end goal. So therefore it says, Hashem says, I want you to be my partner. I'm an employee, a partner. Don't just say, God, whatever you, whatever you want, I'll do. Okay, that's one element. But also recognize that there is a purpose. The purpose of the mitzvahs is to reveal godliness and bring the world to a messianic era. And that's, that's what it means to be a, a partner. So if you look at figure 3.2 on page 114, we have number one, the employee mindset is focused on the job description and his specific job description while the partner mindset is focused on the company mission statement. As we, as God's children, as human beings, have to recognize not only to focus on the job description, which is important, but also focus on the mission statement, is to reveal godliness in the world. And this is another difference between an employee and, 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 and a partner mentality. The employee does their job and gets compensated. That's uh, we call a reward, right? The employee does a job at the end of the day, he gets his money, he goes home, he got, he got his reward, right? The partner is not so much motivated by reward, but by results. The partner is fully invested in this company and he wants to see results. To the employee, you know, say for example, a FedEx, a FedEx uh, delivery man. He comes to the house, drops off, he's doing his job. Does he really care if the FedEx, if FedEx is successful, is not successful? As long as he's employed, he's happy. He's, he's getting rewarded. He's getting a paycheck. The results is, is not his business. That's an employee. But a partner is not just about reward. It's about results. So we can approach a mitzvah with an employee uh, uh, mentality. And with this attitude, we see the mitzvah as rules and regulations. Right? God is telling us how to live our lives, right? And we fulfill them because we get some benefit out of it. Maybe yes, maybe not. And, and that's what a lot of religions believe. A lot of religions, their, their mentality, their, 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 their reaction to mitzvahs 
commandments are reward. Right? What's, what, what's, what's a religion? People will say it's a list of rules that we follow because the, bo the boss up in heaven, he has the power to punish or to reward us. So he told us to eat kosher, so we eat kosher. That's an employee mentality. That's not what Hashem wants of us. Hashem wants a more sophisticated attitude, a mentality. And that is one of a partner. And what, what, what's that of a partner? It's not just about rewards. As we mentioned, it's about results. Let's take a look at text 9. Uh, this is taken from Pirkei Avot, Ethics of Our Fathers. Antignos of Soho received the tradition from Shimon of Tzadik. He would say, do not be as servants who serve their master for the sake of reward. Rather, be as servants who serve their master, not for the sake of reward. Judaism is not about reward. We don't do mitzvahs for reward. We do it for a relationship, a partnership. God wants us to be partners in creation. And as partners, and one of the definitions of a partner is to assume ownership of the goals, of the purpose, of the objectives of the partnership. So when we see Mashiach as something that's actually happening as a result, not a reward, a result of every one of our actions, so this intensifies our sense of partnership and ownership of the mitzvahs that we do. So that's the second element, is reward. the, the employee has a reward-oriented and the partner is results-oriented. And we're supposed to be a partner, which is results. And finally, we have one more, um, one more idea that we are supposed to follow part, as a partner, and that is, the, the, part, the third partner mentality is confidence in the success of the enterprise. Now, if you ask an employee, someone who works for Apple, you go to an Apple store and you say, excuse me, do you think the, this new iPhone is going to be successful? What do they say? Maybe, I hope so, maybe yes, maybe not. They're not sure. But if you ask Tim Cook, as he's giving his presentation, will this be successful? He believes in it. He must believe in it. He better. He better, right? He 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 truly must believe in it because he is the he is the partner. He's the owner, right? So it's not just it's not just that a person says, you know what? I'll do a mitzvah. Maybe Mashiach will come. I believe in Mashiach. I believe he'll come one day. No, we have to be like the partner, like the owner. That our belief in Mashiach is unique, not like the other beliefs. There are thirteen beliefs. You, you, Mashiach is believed because if you look at the at text 10 and, and, and of the um, A, B, and C, there's something unique when it comes to Mashiach that we don't find in other mitzvahs. There are 613 commandments and there are 13 uh, principles of faith, but the faith of Mashiach has one element, maybe you can find it, that none of, no, one, no one else has. Let's look at te text 10a. The 12th foundation of Jewish belief is the era of Mashiach. That is to believe and affirm that he will come and not to think that he will be delayed. In the words of the prophet, if he tarries, expectantly wait, await him. Or text 10b, anyone who does not believe in Mashiach or does not expectantly await his coming denies not only the other prophets, but also the Torah of our teacher, Moshe. And finally, the Animami, and I believe with complete faith in the coming of Mashiach, although he may tarry, I expectantly wait his coming every day. What is the common theme in all these three readings, it's okay. not just to believe, but waiting for him. Right. To anticipate his coming every day. So a person who believes, I believe Mashiach will come one day, Mashiach will come, but doesn't expect and anticipate that it'll happen today is lacking something fundamental in Judaism. Actually, it's lacking something the fundamental idea of what Judaism is all about. Uh, there's actually a story, we'll, we'll, we'll skip over it, but the story uh, uh, of Shob and Levi told in Sanhedrin and in, in Talmud, you know, he asked Mashiach, when are you going to come? Rabbi Shob and Levi saw Mashiach, Mashiach at that time, and he said, when are you going to come? And he said, today. Mashiach didn't come today. So Shob and Levi asked, it was Elijah, yeah, Elijah the prophet, and Mashiach lied. He said he's coming today. He didn't come. So he answered, yes, he's coming today, Hayom, if you, if you follow God's commandments. 
so the, so, so the commentary is asked, what do you mean? So why didn't he say that? Why didn't he say, I'm coming today if you follow my commandments? And the answer is because as a Jew, we have a responsibility to anticipate Mashiach every day he's coming. He didn't come yesterday. Oh, I have to look back and say he didn't come yesterday because perhaps we, we have more work to do. But we shouldn't have the attitude up front. So it's, 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 to take the Tim Cook example again, if something flopped in Apple, what is Tim Cook going to say? No, looking back, we have to fix some stuff. But he'll never say that looking forward. He'll never say, hey, we're introducing this new iPhone 12. It needs a lot of work, but it, it's, it's going to be good. No, when he, he has to believe in the product if he wants to sell it. So too, we have to believe that Mashiach has come today. Uh, it didn't come yesterday, okay? So we look back and we, and we, we have some work to do. But the, 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 the anticipation for Mashiach is something unique that you don't have at other, mitz, at other mitzvahs. So let's go to the next section. The question now is, is that a realistic expectation? Is it realistic to believe Mashiach is coming today? You know, to have faith, okay. You know, even though it's out there, I tell you, you don't have faith. Okay, you can work on that and have faith. But it's quite another thing to expect something to happen immediately. How can we say that we have an obligation to expect Mashiach to come today, every day? So the truth is that this is also part of the partner mentality. As we learned that the partner lives and breathes the mission statement, right? And, and, and is invested in, 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 the, in the enterprise, right? We also learned the fact that the partner believes in the success of the endeavor, right? Unlike the employee who may want it to be successful, but the, the, the partner believes in it. But how do we know the enterprise will succeed? So one answer is that that's why the world was created. That's a simple answer. God created the world for the Messianic era, as we learned a couple of weeks ago. So if that's the case, then how could it not be fulfilled, right? God promised it to us and the prophets uh, prophesied about it. So it has to happen. But there's something deeper involved here. Something that goes to the heart of the way Judaism sees the essence of the human nature and creation. And that is what is reality? What is reality? What we sense as reality is not necessarily reality. What, what reality is, is the divine goodness and divine perfection. What we experience is the concealment of the divine perfection. So let's go back to the piano analogy, right? We may experience the world as a piece of wood, but it's, I mean, that's the piano, right? As a piece of wood, but it really is a piano. So too with the world. The world that Hashem created is, has its inner truth, and that is godliness. Everything God created has a deeper element. We call it in Hebrew, the nitsutz is the spark of godliness in it. That means the real world, the reality of the world is not flawed, is not imperfect, it's not chaotic. That is a concealment of reality. We look around us and we see chaos, we see fighting, we see negativity, we see death, we see all these things. That's not the reality of the world. The reality of the world is the essence of the world, which is godliness. It's like, it's like the human being. Who are you? I, I do this many times. I ask people, who are you? And let's say, uh, John. No, no, <laughs> that's your name. That's not who you are. If you decided to legally change your name tomorrow, you would still be you. Right? Who are you? I'm a doctor. I'm a teacher. That's not who you are. If you got disbarred or you retired, you wouldn't be you? Of course you'd be you. So who are you? I'm an American. That's where you're born. If you were born in Holland, <laughs> you would still be you. Who are you? 
So many times we refer to ourselves as these, these external uh, titles that are just concealments of our essence. That's not our essence. Those things change. Who are you? You're a soul. You're a part of God. You're, you're, you're neshama. That's who we are. That's our essence. We don't see it. Therefore, we, we, therefore it's the last thing we're going to say when we're asked who we are. But in reality, in essence, that's who we are. So to the, so to the world. We say, look around the world and we say, hey, look around us. It's a chaotic world. So it's a negative world. So we think that Mashiach is a dream. Mashiach is a dream. Comes along the Torah and tells us no. What we're experiencing is a dream. The reality of the world is the godliness that's invested in every object of the world. So we have to wake up from the dream. How do we wake up from the dream? That's by doing mitzvah, by revealing one at a time every element and every element in the world and every element within ourselves in order to reveal the Mashiach essence of the world. We have actually, it's a reading about it. Um, I think it's text 13, dream versus reality. It's a long, it's a long text, but it's a, it's a text by the Rebbe, which, which basically brings out this idea that people think that Mashiach is, gonna, Mashiach is a dream. How can Mashiach come? It's, the whole world will change. And, and the Rebbe says, no, no. That is really the essence of the world. The, the, the essence of the world is the Mashiach mentality, Mashiach, Mashiach reality. It's interesting that the word Mashiach, what does the word Mashiach mean? We translate it as Messiah. Anointing really someone. Mean? Right, Mashiach is to anoint. It's it can anointing. also mean eight as well and oil. What's that? It can also mean oil and eight as well. Oil, very good. And eight. And eight. How, how did they anoint? They anointed with oil, right? Kings were anointed with oil. Uh, priests were anointed with oil. The vessels in the temple were anointed with oil. So mm -hmm. Mashiach is, 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 the word Mashiach is associated with anointing and oil. And this is really uh, the essence of what Mashiach is going to accomplish. What is oil? So we find, we've mentioned this many times on Hanukkah, that oil has two opposite properties. And on the one hand, we know that oil rises above all other liquids. It doesn't mix with other liquids. It rises no. above it. But at the same time, you ever try to spill oil? Uh, you ever spill oil on on your uh, desk? It's very tough to get it off. Why? Because it seeps into the wood. It seeps in so much that you can't you can't remove it. It becomes one with the wood. Part of it. That's the dichotomy. It's a sort of, it's, it seems like it's an it's it's a, it's a paradox. On the one hand, oil separates from liquids. On the other hand, it seeps into everything it comes in contact with. But that is really what Mashiach is all about. On the one hand, yes, Mashiach is an elevated state. Mashiach is something that is anointed one, the person who's going to be Mashiach, and the, 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 the era of Mashiach will be an elevated era. But at the same time, it's going to infuse every element, every piece of our physical world will be infused with Mashiach. Mm -hmm. So Mashiach is not going to be for the righteous. Mashiach is not going to be for the holy Mashiach is not going to be the time that we'll, 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 we'll focus on just the Torah and, 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 and the, uh, you know, the Torah scrolls and, and the, phys the, the spiritual elements. Though. No, Mashiach is something that will, that will permeate every physical being. The very table that you're sitting at now, the very uh, clothing you wear, everything will be infused with Mashiach. And that's why today, in order for us to reveal Mashiach, we, we do that by utilizing every physical object that we have, because that is what Mashiach is all about. It's about infusing everything with a sense of, of, of holiness, of, of, of spirituality. And therefore, Hashem, when Hashem gave us mitzvahs, and you don't find this in, in, in many other, I don't know, maybe any other religion, where you have so many commandments, so many rituals, so many that, that literally dictate every moment of our day. You open up a code of Jewish law, and some people open up and it seems odd. You wake up, and the code of Jewish law would tell us how to wake up, what to do when we wake up, wash our hands this way, that way, and when we get dressed, which hand to put into your sleeve first? 
which shoe to tie first? I mean, come on, leave me alone. <laughs> this is my life. You want to tell me you have to study Torah? Fine. But every single ex ex element of our life has to be, has, the Torah has to dictate how, well, if you're looking at the Torah as a bunch of rules, you got a point. Enough with the rules. right? Let me live my life. But if you look at the mitzvahs as an opportunity to infuse that physical object or that energy of, that we're using with godliness, with the Mashiach element, then yes, the more the better. Then every single motion that we make during the day should be in a Mashiach manner. So the, the Shulchan Aruch says, put in your right hand first. When you get rest, it should be your right first because right represents chesed, kindness, compassion, and we should be aware of that when we get rest in the early in the morning. Wash your hands. Wash your right hand first. Again, right is chesed. Wake up to that notion, to that mindset that today is going to be a chesed, a kindness, a compassion day. When it comes to tying one's shoes, we tie our left shoe first, as it says, uh, it says the code of Jewish law. Tying mm -hmm. represents the tefillin. Also, we wrap our tefillin. We tie the tefillin on the left hand because we, there has to be a a uh, sort of a balance. Whilst there's compassion, 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 but there are also there are times that we have to hold back, that we have to restrain ourselves. It's also a very important element of our life. So as we're waking up and as we're doing these, these mundane activities, we're connecting to Hashem by learning the messages and, and digesting the messages of getting dressed and how to use the restroom and how to, how to go about our day and do business. And it's, it's amazing how Torah infuses every moment of our lives, not as rules, but as opportunities in order to bring the messianic era, messianic uh, um, uh, light into our physical world. So that's our job. Our job is to really uh, slowly but surely, every day, every, every uh, week, every month, to instill, to implement another mitzvah, another element. It doesn't have to be something huge, but just something that will make us more aware on a daily basis of our connection, of our mission, with uh, to bring Mashiach into the world. Now, some people say that, you know, Mashiach, I'm not gonna bother God with Mashiach. And I heard, I heard this, you know, let, let him bring whatever he wants. It's his decision. Let him bring Mashiach. All right, so you know, the, Rebbe, the Rebbe started a, a, a song. They sang it in 1981, I believe. Is it, we want Mashiach now, we don't wanna wait. We grew up with that song. We want Mashiach now. We want Mashiach now. Mashiach now. We don't want to wait. I'm Israel. Have no fear, Mashiach. Well, and and the Rebbe would constantly encourage, especially children, and everyone to, to to say, "We want Mashiach." And and there was people who opposed it and says, uh, "What what are you bothering God for? Let him bring Mashiach whenever he wants to." But the Rebbe's attitude was that Mashiach is not a reward. It's not something that if it was a reward, then you're right, don't bother God. Whenever he wants to reward you, that he'll do it. It's fine. Don't, don't push him. But Mashiach is not a reward. Result. Mashiach is a result. Mashiach is part of the, of the enterprise. So imagine if someone says, you know, I'm working for, uh, you know, Chabad. Let's say someone says, hey, Rabbi, I want to work for Chabad. I don't care what you stand for. for. I don't care what the results are. I don't care. Just I want to work for you. I say, I'm sorry, I'm not hiring you. <laughs> I want to hire somebody who has a passion. With somebody who knows the result, who knows what we're here for, who knows what, what, what the mission is. When we demand Mashiach, when we ask Hashem to bring Mashiach, we're expressing the idea that we know what the purpose of creation is. We appreciate it. Hashem, bring Mashiach. Reveal the purpose that you created the world for. We're trying to do our part. And, you know, it says that all we need now is the final nail final nail to, 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 to bring it, to make it a reality, and to bring the world into Messianic era. So well, that will conclude today's lesson. Uh, God hey, willing. Rabbi, can I ask next you something week? real quick? Yeah, one second. Next Hi. week next next week is Shavuot. So Monday and Tuesday is a holiday. It's actually the day that Hashem gave us the Torah. So next week, we're going to have our lesson on Wednesday. If you can't make it on Wednesday, we're going to record it. We record every lesson, actually, and we're going to uh, we'll send it out. Uh, but Wednesday at 7.30 next week, we'll uh, do the lesson. We are having special uh, services on Shavuot. Uh, Shavuot is Monday and Tuesday. We'll have services at Chabad. Uh, Monday morning, we'll read the Torah, uh, the Ten Commandments at Chabad with a uh, dairy lunch. 
And then at five o'clock, we're doing something on a new property, a big uh, a dairy uh, and Ten Commandments uh, Shavuos party. And it'll be God willing next Monday. So uh, it's again, we'll conclude the way we began. We ask Hashem to bring the Mashiach and truly reveal the goodness in the world, the, the, the purpose in the world today. Our, our, our people, our brothers and sisters are, are, are suffering. I spoke to someone uh, today from Ashkelon who literally, they're, 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 they're in their bunkers. They hear the, the, this, the, the sirens and the, and the, the bombs coming in uh, on, on a constant basis. And uh, we ask Hashem to, to finish it. Finish it off already. Bring Mashiach. Bring peace to the world. Bring tranquility to the world. Let, let the world see the real truth. And I'm Yisrael, that we are really doing what we are doing for the sake of peace. And all we want is peace. And uh, may Hashem bring Mashiach now. Hey, Rabbi. Okay. So with that, the, the lesson's concluded. Men, one second. You can ask questions now. Those who I have to leave, you're welcome to leave. No offense. Hey, Rabbi. Yeah. Yes. I found out that my mother's, my grandmother's my, on my mother's side's last name was Potokin, a Jewish last name. Will that be enough to convince the mate Din of my Jewishness? So that you'll have to contact the RCC. RCC. So would Potokin help, help my case? That my, my, my grandmother's last name was, was Potokin? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if last name is. It is a Jewish last name. It is a Jewish last name. Yes, yes. I know there are many Jews with, with many non Jews with the last name Cohen. And uh, even though a uh, Jew with the last name Robinson, so it, last names don't really uh, say everything. Your own last name is not a Jewish one, as you said. Yeah. So you, you call, call the RCC. Let's see what they say. They, they, they'll be able to help you. Can I uh, use character tests to request a safe site conversion if I need to, as opposed to a regular one? We'll, yeah, we'll be, we'll be in touch. What I mean? with you. Yeah, yeah. Contact me outside of this class. We'll uh, we'll be in touch, God willing. I was just asking you after before after that, you know, these questions. Yeah. Okay, definitely. Very good. Any other questions? I have a question, Rabbi. Yeah. Um, it has to do with the last week's parsha when you were talking about the number three is also a special number in the Torah, and you gave a couple examples. Can you uh, repeat that? So I can write mention it. that the number three represents unity. The Torah is. I think it was a Talmud that mentions that there's many threes revolving the Torah. The Torah is a three-part Torah, Tanakh, right? The Torah, the prophets, and the writings. The Torah was given to a three-pronged nation, the Kohanim, the priests, the Levites, and the Israelites. The Torah was given by a third child. Moses was the third child of his family. The Torah was given on the third month, in the third month, right? There's Nisan, Eir, and Siva. The third day when the Jewish people came to Mount Sinai. Uh, so there are a lot of threes that are associated with, with, with the Torah because three represents peace. One peace. is one. Two is, one is God. Two is potential for disharmony, for, for discord. But then three represents a third actually as the ability to connect the, the first two. It's like the mediator. So uh, three represents peace in Torah. And that's why the Torah was given um, associated with the number three. Thanks. Torah is meant to bring peace to the world. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Have a great evening. Great seeing you again tonight. And be well. Be healthy. Let's bring Mashiach. Amen. Amen.